So welcome, everyone, to yet another Rising Tide Foundation Sunday lecture. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of new faces here, and I'm very, very excited to listen to the presentation that will be delivered uh, by Lawrence Freeman. I'll just say a couple of quick words of introduction, uh, just to sort of set the tone, I suppose, uh, for what we're about to hear today. And one thing that's important, I think, to keep in mind, based on the developments of the past few days, is that there's a lot of fear, a lot of confusion. Um, we don't necessarily know what the unfolding days are going to look like necessarily. Um, what is very important to always keep in mind, though, is a sense of the universal to keep your, your, um, your North Star always in mind when you're traveling through turbulent waters. And in this period of history, the waters are getting very turbulent, especially if you're looking at the North American sort of transatlantic zone. There, um, <clears throat> I mean, again, it's been messy. So one of the, the problems that sort of induces a lot of the fear, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the collapse of individual judgment and people are losing increasingly their ability to use their own powers of sovereign thinking, it's the, it comes from both a, a lack of sense of historical dynamics, of the, which really is the context of the world that we live in, right? We are the, the effect of these broader historical sweeps um, and also a, lot, a lack of sense of top-down global thinking. So what are the real global dynamics that are defining our destinies? Um, when you take that more healthy perspective in mind, though, you start recognizing that we don't have one, but we have two coexisting systems that are at, at war with each other, that are in a major conflict over which will determine, which will be the dominant operating system coming out of the current storm and defining humanity's coming generations and longer. On the one hand, we do have a system um, which many have come to despise rightfully so for um, its injustice. It's, it's I, the, the principle of a unipolar world order um, <clears throat> that's a very, very much modeled on a closed system where all resources are monopolized, where all uh, energy within the system is controlled and kept in a, in a certain state of equilibrium for um, a, a grouping of sociopathic elites, for lack of a better word. That's one way of organizing society. And, and we've seen what a uh, disaster that type of self-organization has done when we've permitted it to occur historically, going back to the collapse of the Roman Empire, um, the, the collapse of the Dark Ages in the, in the 14th century. Um, and that's not something we want to really tolerate doing again, especially in a world with nearly 8 billion people and uh, the atomic power of nuclear warheads all over the world. That's not something to tolerate once more. On the other hand, we have a, a multipolar system, which is more built around a concept of win-win cooperation, an idea of an open system where it's not exclusive to those who are already within that dynamic, but rather it's open for other people to join. And this is a system which is based upon building long-term great infrastructure mega projects, the sorts of things we used to do here in the West, but have forgotten how to do for a very long time. That's really animating uh, in a very vital way another part of the world. And increasingly, we have almost 140 nations joining into the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, one doesn't want to obviously paint a, a too rosy picture that everything is perfect, but it's definitely a system which is much more in harmony with natural law and the moral fitness of humanity's ability to survive. Um, it's also a vital part of the ingredient if the West, if the collapsing European, North American countries are going to survive, it will be because we tap into and accept the olive branches that have been offered to us uh, by members, leading members of the Eurasian Alliance and the Multipolar Alliance. So today, uh, based on that, that theme, which we've been exploring over the past several weeks with lectures dealing with the historical forgotten dynamics of the American system of Alexander Hamilton uh, that arose out of the wake of the American Revolution, um, and that we had lectures that got uh, to, to introduce people to what, was people, what were people like Abraham Lincoln, like William 
uh, McKinley actually bringing online such that when they were snuffed out in their lifetimes as presidents of America, uh, the opposing unipolar paradigm took over and uh, brought America out of its natural constitutional traditions. Same thing for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, another lover of a multipolar perspective of win-win. So this is something which uh, Larry Freeman has mastered. I mean, this, this Larry Freeman is a, an individual, a very unique figure who has devoted his entire adult life to the cause of humanity and has written extensively thousands, literally thousands of articles. You can just Google his name um, and, uh, and you'll find thousands of articles written over the course of four decades on uh, Africa, on development, on analyses of those wishing to keep uh, true development away from the majority of the world population, especially with a focus on Africa. And he's a figure who has worked uh, as a leading scientific advisor, vice president of the, on the, um, the, the Lake Chad Basin Commission, which is a wonderful project to really revitalize Africa, which because of China's influence there under the last several years, especially has, has come back to life after being forgotten for decades. And there's a project that many of you know uh, will be involving moving massive amounts of of water for 2000 kilometers from the Congo River into replenishing Lake Chad. And Larry has really developed uh, international collaborators, partners and friends uh, who have committed themselves to advancing this as part of one of many grand projects for the Belt and Roads uh, development of the African continent. Um, so with that, there's a lot more to say, but I, I think that I'll just let Larry and, uh, and uh, his mind speak for itself as I, I pass the baton over. So Lawrence, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, just a few words about myself, uh, as Matthew said a lot. Increasingly over the last 30 years, I've been involved in uh, promoting African development policies as we were discussing before official start. About three and a half years ago, my wife and I set up my website, Lawrence Freeman Africa in the World, and that gave me a chance to uh, circulate uh, my ideas. So there's plenty of material there to read if you're interested. I, I do interviews on Press TV, uh, RT, CGTN, and I also occasionally write for CGTN. I'm an instructor in some local area schools where I teach uh, about, I guess now five, four or five courses on African history. Each course is about 12 hours long. And I've been traveling to Africa since uh, 1994. I've been probably made about two dozen visits to the continent. Uh, in the 90s and up through 2018, I spent a, a lot of time in Nigeria. That was the first country I landed in 1994. And, uh, it was quite an experience then. Uh, and I still work with Nigeria. Uh, I made vis visited Sudan many, many times and tried to steer the Sudanese government in the right direction with uh, not much success. I have been to Ethiopia several times, which I consider a very interesting country in terms of its outlook on development. And of course, it's been in the news nonstop for the last couple of years, one around the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and now about the actions taken by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed in Tigray. And I've written extensively on both of these subjects and uh, support the efforts of the government. And recently I returned, um, in the, I was in two weeks in Cote d'Ivoire, the last week of uh, October into November. I had a vote absentee ballot because I arrived back late election night. And I was observing their election. I was an official observer, so I got to walk around and observe their election. And they also gave me an opportunity to learn about the country attend some very interesting seminars. Uh, so I have a, a working knowledge of parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's a huge, huge continent. I will kind of divide my class today or discussion presentation into two sections. One is, uh, I think probably minority people looking at the uh, attendance are familiar with Africa. So I'm gonna run through some African slides to get everyone familiar because it's uh, huge and, and my course is only touch on a portion of, of Africa because there's so much to be studied there. And then on the and then I will end up specifically we have to people have this background with discussing the Hamiltonian perspective uh, for for Africa. Uh, I'll start off by one give you one paradox 
which is not, it will, it will take you a while to answer. Why is the area of the world where the strong hypothesis is, was the beginning of human civilization, homo sapiens, sapien thinking power. Why is that area of the world that's the beginning of what we call the cradle of civilization, the most underdeveloped area of the world today? How did that happen over millions and millions of years to the present? And I would say, as I always uh, advise my uh, students, you will not find any answers to the problems in Africa from reading the media. They will give you topical descriptions of strongmen, and dictatorships and corruption, and not all of them. I mean, they have, there's elements of truth, but none of them provide a comprehensive explanation for what's going on in Africa. And uh, my own personal policy that I came to several years ago, decades ago, is that there's enough people criticizing Africa every day in the United States and around the world. And I would, uh, I would only criticize policies of Africa and advocate positive policies, but I don't enter, enter, involve myself in partisan politics inside the nation. I give people who are thoughtful new ways of looking at the current problems and solutions, which I'm working on a project uh, right now to do that. All right, with that said, uh, I'm gonna show you some slides which uh, give you a picture of what I would call the diversity of Africa. And then we'll keep going from there. If you have questions, um, I'm perfectly capable of taking time out. I, I see we don't, for whatever reason, we don't have the chatbot working, which I usually use. But if you, there is uh, on reactions, um, you can raise your hand and if, I'll stop periodically and take a look and see if there's anything. We don't have to wait to the end, but if you, you want to listen to everything first before you ask your questions, that's fine as well. Okay. I'll just say too, uh, before um, Larry uh, gets into the, the program, um, if people could make sure that their mute is on, that's yeah. uh, useful. And then as you have a question, you can obviously take yourself off of mute. Okay. Okay. That's my website, lawrencefreemanafricanintheworld.com. Okay. Now, I always start every single class with a map of Africa. And I always give my students a question. How many countries do you think are in Africa? And no one's ever gotten it correct. But uh, I'm sure some people do know on this call. So we're not gonna go through that exercise. But there was recently a decision made, which in my uh, opinion is, uh, un it's a dubious decision, but there's a small area, if you look above Mauritania, below Morocco, which is called Western Sahara, which has been a disputed territory for decades. And it has to do a lot with uh, Morocco-Algerian relations. And it's a very complicated topic. But Western Sahara has now been considered a nation. So now there are 55 nations uh, on the continent of Africa. And that inc includes some very large areas of territory, such as if you look in the center of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Algeria, the two largest, I'm not sure which is the largest, before them, before South Sudan separated, Sudan was the largest country. So you have some very large territories. Uh, Population-wise, uh, if you look at the, um, hold on a second, if you look at uh, right around where that indentation takes place, which is sometimes called the Bight of Benin uh, or uh, off the Atlantic Ocean, it's like someone took a bite out of Africa. You see Nigeria, which has over 200 million people and is going to be, the, is projected to be in a few decades, the lar third largest country, nation in the world. Egypt has over 100 million people. Ethiopia is approaching 110 million people. Uh, the population is quite large and we'll discuss that because of the uh, population of the whole continent. Well, let me, let me go to a few more slides and I'll discuss the population question as it comes up. Now, this is uh, the primary subject that I will be 
emphasizing today is sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan, and we'll, you'll see this in a couple of uh, minutes, is all those countries who have part of their country below the Sahara Desert. So if you look at that gray area, which we'll look at more carefully, that's the Sahara Desert. Sudan, Chad, Niger, Mali, they all have part of their country, their nation is in the desert, but because part of it is not, the official definition of the United Nations, it's called, they're all part of sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see there's very few countries, I'm thinking uh, six, seven, eight, if I count them, countries that are not in sub-Saharan Africa. That's the bulk of the, of the continent. And um, it's also the for more, most underdeveloped portion of the continent relative to North Africa. Not that all of North Africa is developed, but there are sections of North Africa that are. So that's what we're gonna be mainly focusing on is Sub-Saharan Africa. Those are all the countries in red. Now, that's how big the United, Africa is. Most people re don't realize that. It's uh, the, United, the United, continental United States is about 3 million square miles. So Africa is almost four times the size of continental United States. And you can see all the countries that fit in the African continent. Now, when you look at a map, you'll never see this because maps try to homogenize relations of uh, this, the continents. But actually, you can see the size of Africa. It's, it's second in size to the Asian continent. Now, this gives you, again, the diversity in Africa is beyond which you would normally expect. Um, you can see changes in the United States. I've been all over the United States. So I'm going on 70 years, so I've been around. I've been to all parts. But yeah, you go to the West Coast, you see palm trees, different. You go to Florida, it's different. You go to the southern part of the United States. I spent a lot of time in Mississippi a long time ago. But nothing like this. I mean, Africa is really uh, so varied that it's, it's hard to imagine that it's the same continent. What you're seeing up on top, that's the Sahara Desert, which is approximately the size of the United States, the biggest, hottest, driest area in the world. Below that, that thin brownish line you're seeing, that's the Sahel, S-A-H-E-L. And that is the thin desert, it's a transition desert into the Sahara. And below that, you start to get into what they call um, the savanna, and then you get into that dark blue in the middle, which is the dense area of the Congo River Basin. Then you see some more deserts in the south, uh, the big red desert there uh, in southwest Africa. Uh, you see this, I mean, there's the difference from one part of Africa to another is enormous. And of course, we really can't go into detail on this, but it's something to at least visualize. Now, this I put up here to just show you again, this is just a, there's actually enormous amount of water in Africa. Uh, like projects we have in the United States, I know it's been discussed before in terms of Nawapa, it's a question of moving the water to the right place. These are, these are only a handful of the biggest rivers. There are, there are hundreds of rivers of various sizes. The big brown spot at the top you see is the Sahara Desert. There's only one way, there's only one water route that crosses the Sahara Desert and that's the Nile River. The longest river in the world. I think it's 6,200 kilometers long and it flows south to north. And there's, there's such a rich history about the Nile because of civilizations that created partially Ethiopian, partially Sudan, the Egyptian civilization. And it's also been a major source of uh, conflict because the British early on realized to control the continent, they wanted to control the Nile River system since it runs down a good portion of the spine. It could have started in Lake, may have started in Lake Victoria, there are other discussions, but that's the area. So it crosses from the Mediterranean across the desert into deep into the continent. And this makes it a very important river. Uh, the, if you look over to the left, you see the Niger River, which is also a very long river. Uh, by the way, the Nile is not the most voluminous river. It's not a powerful river. 
The Niger River is also quite long, I think 4,200 kilometers, and it's also not voluminous. The Niger River plays a very important part in the history of Africa because you can see it touches into the brown section. So that, in West Africa, that was the way to get into the desert, was the Niger River. And they kept looking for ways to cross the desert. And it was for hundreds of years, it was a very difficult experience. Explorers were dying, almost dying. You read the books, I have dozens of books on these subjects. They, one guy had to cut open the belly of his camel and drink the urine because he was dying of thirst in the, as he was crossing the desert. That's a very important river that crosses through very several countries. And uh, right there at the turn is where Timbuktu is, which is famous. And it was on, important because it was on the Niger River. And it also unloads into the Niger Delta in Nigeria, the Bight of Benin. And it also, there's an inland delta on the Niger, the Niger River in, in Mali. Uh, the Zambezi River to the south is very important. Uh, Livingston and others thought the Zambezi River might be the beginning of the, uh, well, they thought the Congo River, which I put over in the right, because it is such a dominant force in the central part of the continent. And you can see, the, the it doesn't have it on the map, but if you look right above, uh, right, be right below Central African Republic, that border is a borderline of the uh, Ubangi River, which is the major tributary into the Congo River, which uh, leashes somewhere between uh, 1.2 or more trillion cubic, of, cubic meters of water per year. But it also is an enormous transportation route and it affects the economies of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Congo next to it, the Central African Republic. And um, it's a completely underdeveloped uh, country. Most people thought they would, the most value was in metals and rare metals and uh, precious metals. But really its value is it has enormous agricultural potential only which a tiny fraction is being developed as in the case of many parts of Africa. So this just gives you a big, again, I'm just giving you snapshots so you have some familiarity with, with, with Africa. This is another way of looking at the Africa. You see the Sahara on top. Uh, you see right below it, the Sahel, the green area is again, savanna to dense forest. And then you have the Kalahari Desert, which we saw in the other picture in the southern part of Africa, another desert. And on the right, you see the Great Rift Valley, which I'm gonna show you a couple more slides because that is an area of active Teutonic volcanic activity. Okay, so this will be the last picture of the Sahara Desert you see, but again, uh, on the left, you see its relationship to the other parts of the continent. I mean, it's, and it's completely underpopulated. And for reasons of its underpopulation and the intentional lack of development, it's also the most concentrated area of terrorist activity, violent extremists, all uh, AQIM and others operate in the Sahara. And uh, because of the short-sightedness of the United States in particular and other countries, uh, we've spent billions and billions of dollars on counterterrorism training, which has failed completely. As you may have noticed, there was another coup in Mali last year. Uh, and because we didn't develop this area, its lack of development makes it, uh, uh, makes it ideal for activities of terrorism. And that's where most of the bases operate out of. Here's another shot. So this separates the continent very clear. In fact, if you look at the desert on the top, this is part of a belt of deserts that go across Africa, across Saudi Arabia, uh, into China. And then again, in the middle, you see green, and then you see the dark green. And that's again, the Congo River Basin. That body of water in the lower mid right, that's probably Lake Victoria. And that little dot of blue in the Sahara Desert, that's Lake Chad which is uh, dear to my heart, something that I've devoted a large portion of my life to, and we'll, we'll probably discuss that a little bit as well. Uh, now, okay, all right, I'm gonna go back. This is the Great Rift Valley, and it extends all the way from the Arabian Plate down, I think, through Mozambique. So it crosses over Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, into Mozambique. 
there is active volcanic activity there. And this is a is uh, expected to be a sep this Teutonic plate, which is not which is separating here. They call it the Somalian plate is separating from the Nubian plate, and then somewhere in one to three million years, they expect that this plate will separate off. And if you look on the bottom, you see Madagascar is a big separate island. This will be even bigger, much bigger than Madagascar when it separates. But you'll have to wait for your great 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 children to observe it. And then on the left, you just see how the valley is just is indented down. Uh, I think the next one has some figures. There it is. Uh, 20 million years old, 6,000 miles long, and uh, hundreds of feet below sea level, 6,000. And here on the right is a more schematic area. Now, this is also, and this is an area of thinking, pose another wild hypothesis to you, but you got to keep thinking these ways. Uh, we don't have time to go into in this class, but this is the area where a great deal of the early fossils of man was, was found, not exclusive, but in Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, which is on this map here, they have found a great deal of the fossils that indicated uh, the development of what we call modern man, or I call homo sapiens sapien, wise, wise man, came out of this area. Now, is there a connection between the geographical, uh, geological development in that area and the development of mankind? So throw that out to you to give you some thought. When you have nothing else to think about at night and you can't sleep. Uh, here's another picture, and this is my wife and I we visited the Rift Valley. Uh, she's obviously uh, on the right there in one of the pictures and on the left in the other. This was a desolate park. We did my entire 25 trips of going to Africa. I've had one leisurely vacation sightseeing, which was two days in Southern Ethiopia. Uh, and this is a park uh, where they allow people to live and they live in the most horrible conditions of poverty, along with some animals. Uh, and uh, this on the left, this woman, young lady, is looking at my wife's camera because if she has never seen a camera before. These pools of water on the left, they're over 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperature because of the active volcanic activity. I put my finger in one. They cook on them. They clean their clothes in them. Uh, we saw a woman put a robe around her, a blanket actually sat on above one of these for a steam bath. And just a few hundred yards away with this picture of myself and the, uh, the guard, the game reserve guard, uh, is a lake of perfectly temp temperature. And they're right next to each other. And this is particular to the Rift Valley. Now, I'll go back to a slide I skipped over. Uh, I teach a lot of classes to elderly people, and I always tell them that, that many of us are older than almost every African nation. And you see the nations with the dates they became independent. Now, again, visualize in your mind the earliest slide I showed you of Sub Saharan Africa. And in Sub Saharan Africa, all most of the liberation takes from colonialism, takes place beginning around 1960. Ghana is, is considered the, the leading country, and we'll go into it just a little bit, for the liberation movements, that's 1957. And then there's about 30 countries that are liberated, liberated from colonialism, either British or French primarily, um, between 1960 and the early 60s. The couple of anomalies on the map, you see a big uh, dark Ethiopia, on the right, because Ethiopia was never colonized. And Ethiopia, because of that, has very, it's embedded in their psychology, if you will, their identity, just the way I believe the United States, the best part of us is, comes from our constitution. I'm not really excited about our leadership over the last five decades, but the constitution keeps all of us together on the highest level. In Ethiopia, it's the Battle of Adwa which is March 1st, 1898, either eight or six, I'm forgetting now. Uh, 
they defeat, I think it was 96, oh, I can't remember. They defeat the Italian army on the battlefield. And this had never been done, of course, in all the colonial campaigns, the colonial powers always won. The Italians got defeated militarily on the battlefield. And this shook the foundations of the world. More Europe, the United States, because we, were, we weren't a colonial power. But in, 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 United, in Europe, they, were, they really went crazy. And the government fell in, in Italy and they couldn't believe that uh, black, savage, heathen Africans could defeat a modern European colonial power. And this had a, this had a big effect across the whole continent. Um, and uh, even to today, it has, an interest, it has an effect. So that's very interesting. So it was never colonized. Liberia has a very different kind of formation, which comes from some of the free slaves of the United States. There you see the Western Sahara. But otherwise, you see, um, you see uh, many of the countries, 1960s, uh, Namibia, 1990, which means Namibia is 30 years old, pretty young. Uh, Zimbabwe, which is under attack, good deal of the time, only became independent in 1980. That's two generations. And there's a whole history of Zimbabwe. And of course, you're probably familiar with Robert Mugabe. But most of it, you don't understand. Most people are not allowed to understand because of the way it's covered, that this was a, a, an incredible movement and an effort to actually return land to the Black Zimbabweans that was stolen by the white British and uh, Rhodesians. And that has uh, tied up the history, but the people I know from Zimbabwe, their older brothers and sisters and parents were in the 90s, and all the way for the last, for a couple of decades, were, were packing sidearm pistols to defend themselves against the whites, who I think numbered about 4,500, but had 70% of the fertile land of Zimbabwe. And then if you look, now this map does not have the separation of Sudan from South Sudan, which took place in 2011, which I was opposed to because the Sudan, South Sudan was not equipped to be a nation. And it turned out worse than I expected. It's, a, it's been a failed nation for uh, since it's founded. Uh, July 9th, so July 9th of this year will be 10 years of South Sudan. South Africa is listed as 1994 because that's when it freed itself from the apartheid regime. So you get an idea, very young continent. Now, why do we have nations being formed that are younger than me and maybe some other people uh, on this uh, discussion? Why are they, uh, why does Africa have the youngest nations when it had the oldest civilization? That's something to think about. So we went through those. Now, this is again, uh, just to give you the broadest brush strokes, very broad. Again, you're dealing with 55 nations. I mean, it, none of them, except ones that split off from some, none of them were at, formed in the same way. So you look on the right, you see uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, you see Ethiopia. Uh, then on the other side, you see the West, what they call on this map, the West African Imperial System. It was actually, these are Sudanic states. Sudan, I see, Sudanic, because Sudan, the Sudan, was a whole strip along the Sahel it was called Sudan, the land of the blackhead in Arabic. And Al-Bayel, maybe my Arabic is good enough. And they formed, the Sudanic states in West Africa formed completely different than anywhere else. A lot of them had to do with finding gold. A lot of them had to do with the Niger River, which runs through the various empires that they had. That's completely different than Ethiopia, which is on the water and on the highlands and has 80% of the tallest mountains in Africa in Ethiopia, which uh, Sudan then develops uh, really in a back and forth relationship with Egypt, but you wouldn't be able to tell, I didn't put on this slideshow, that the 
both Sudan and Egypt were pharaonic cultures. And I could show you pictures in, of Sudan that you couldn't tell the difference between Nubian princess carving statue in Sudan from what you see when you go to uh, Cairo uh, and visit the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, pyramid and other structures. And Sudan, of course, claims that it is the birthplace of the Nubian Empire, which they claim is the oldest civilization on, in Africa. All kinds of fun things to look into. Nothing is simple, nothing is obvious. And then on the bottom, you see Bantu states. What does that mean? It means that those states all came from the Bantu migration, which was a migration, a language culture migration, Bantu. It means the one and the many, the person and people. And they migrated somewhere from Cameroon, Nigeria, around 2000 BC, and it went for 3000 years in various waves. And the Bantu culture brought science, farming, iron building, all this stuff to Central Africa. Central Africa is a product of the Bantu culture. And if you examine all the different languages in uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, all of them, you will see the phonetic connections to the Bantu language. And again, this is something I we don't have time to review, but I want to give you an idea of how varied the uh, history of Africa is. It's mind boggling. And me as a student of it, I've only been able to assimilate a tiny percentage. And some people think I know a lot. <laughs> and yet it's very difficult to know it all. I don't think anyone could. This is another picture. Now, there you see up on the left, those are the major Sudanic states, which had, I don't know if they were empires, but they had a structure, a top-down structure. And the first one was Ghana. It was followed by the Mali Empire. And then it was followed by the Songhai Empire. And then they extended over about as far as Lake Chad into, uh, into Nigeria, which is where you see the Hausa. And then the shaded areas on the bottom, those are all products of the Bantu migration. And then you see up on the upper right again, you see Ethiopia, Aksum, which was the original empire that led to Ethiopia, very, very advanced civilization. You see Nubia, which is Sudan, Kush, which is Sudan. And above that, you would see um, Egypt. So these are all ancient states, but the arrows show you the, the Bantu migration. I don't know, I may have another picture of the Bantu migration, I'm not sure. Okay. Now, what happens, we don't really ever, will ever know what happens to these civilizations. I mean, Timbuktu was extremely advanced. In fact, there are reports of people going to Timbuktu that would look like European cities. They're very interesting reports, commerce, scholarly work, uh, when Mali would, government was overthrown and the Tuaregs and the AQIM moved into Timbuktu, uh, they were interfering, destroying, stealing uh, papers that were thousands, over a thousand years old from doctors, scientists, astronomers, scholars, all stored in Timbuktu. And if you want to read an amusing story, which I think is mostly true, uh, it's easy read. It's called uh, How the Badass Librarians Saved Timbuktu. <laughs> and it talks about how these librarians risked their lives to move some of the material away from the terrorists and Tuaregs who were moving into the area. But we don't really, these cultures now, European culture was more advanced in many, many ways. Whether, uh, what would have happened to these cultures if European culture treated them differently, how they would have developed, uh, there are all kinds of advanced uh, production, uh, construction in Africa, such as the churches in Lala Bella, which uh, were built out of solid rock, top down with just a 60 minutes uh, presentation on them. Uh, the Zimbabweans built a great wall around 1100. And when the Europeans came, they couldn't believe that the savages, as they called them in Africa, built these things. So they claimed they, <laughs> they claimed they were built by Europeans, but of course they were built by Africans. Uh, so we, we'll never know how these cultures would have developed because very early on 
slavery after the uh, Gama uh, circumnavigates Africa around 1497 to 99, he makes a complete trip around the entire continent. And the Portuguese and Henry the Navigator, they were already moving, but they thought the whole center of Africa, there were no human beings. They knew there was a Sahara Desert because there was trade with the desert, across the desert. But they didn't really know what was below it. And they thought it was just savages, but not human beings. Yet when they first started making these trips around the coast, I don't have the picture here, around the 1420s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they were landing in Africa and they were, um, take, the first slaves were taken during that period. I'm thinking 14, 22 to 1440, they're already taking slaves, uh, out of, definitely out of Nigeria and other places, mainly for servants back in Europe. The main slavery was not, did not begin in this period, but it started in this period. And here you have Almina in Ghana, which now is all a big tourist attraction, but this is the slave castle that the Portuguese built in 1482. This is the oldest European structure on the African continent. And uh, I didn't show you the pictures, but my wife is about five foot tall, tried to get through some of the dungeons where they kept the slaves and she could barely fit in. Uh, it, was, it was a real horror show, but I don't wanna show you that part of it in our presentation today. This is uh, the slave trade. You saw some pictures like this from uh, Nancy Spanis in her presentation. The majority go <coughs> into Brazil and to the West Indies. A small percentage goes into the United States, the, mainly the South, for slavery, basically cheap labor. Now this whole, the impetus for the slave trade <coughs> was the sweet tooth of Europe. They loved sugar. And so they needed cheap labor for the sugar plantations, which started out on uh, in, um, I don't see it on the map. Uh, what's the, the islands off the coast of North Africa, I'm forgetting what they are. That's where it's, they had a few plantations in that area and they needed cheap labor and they didn't have enough cheap labor in Europe because I've been to a sugar plantation. It's very labor intensive. You need labor and you need water. Uh, and this, the slavery just took off in the late 1600s, 1700s, and through the 1800s. And it was mainly around the sugar trade. Uh, so here's a map, gives you a little bit of information. This map says 10 to 15 million people. I've seen other projections I've added up. 18 million slaves were taken. Some say much more. I've been unable to verify that. One to three million slaves died on the boat taking them across the ocean. Uh, this is the largest forced migration in human history. Nothing has ever approximated this, nothing. I mean, this is, this is not just genocide. Uh, this is forced deportation. This destroyed what was going on in Africa. Labor was destroyed, farming was destroyed, families were destroyed. Productivity was destroyed. Learning was destroyed. People were, people were leaving their families to run deeper and deeper into the heart of Africa to avoid being taken. You were taking the most productive labor of That is men and women between the most productive years of their life, teenagers into the mid twenties and thirties. Population Africa suffered a, a loss in population, a loss in everything. And the, and the the psychological and identity effects still continue today. So you probably, I mean, as a Africanist in Washington, I'm considered uh, eccentric because I look at these questions. And, and, and when people say, oh, well, you know, that happened 400, 500 years ago, long ways of history have their effects. And this effect continued. Uh, and there's no it's not that this can be undone, but at least we should try to understand it. Here's a, another picture, uh, let's see, okay. It was called the Triangle Trade because it was Europe to Africa, one side of the triangle, 
and then South America to North America, another side of the triangle, and then finished products back to Europe. So they called it the triangle slave trade. I didn't put that map up here. This became the West Indies is where the huge sugar production, these became the most valuable possessions of the British Empire per square area was this because they were selling sugar. And, it didn't, and most of these, some started out as French, but a lot of them were taken over by the British. But this is the, this was the high income advanced part of revenue production for the British Empire. Now you had slavery in the United States. Slavery obviously was so expanded that entire places in Manchester, Liverpool, other parts of England built up a shipbuilding industry, a banking industry, an insurance industry all around the slave trade. Uh, I, I mean, there are people trying to say that the, the founding of colonists, the United States, brought slaves over. We didn't. It was the British who brought the slaves over. Uh, and it was the slave South that depended on the slaves. The actual policies of, of Hamilton and his followers was antithetical to slavery because they depended on an educated, advanced, trained workforce. Backwardness of the plantation was the real heart of slavery. I think the largest single portion of slaves went to Brazil. But uh, probably, we'll never know the this constant re-evaluation studying of these records. I think it's safe to say 15 million plus slaves were taken forcibly and deported from the African continent. Now this shows you um, the areas around the borders, the circumference of Africa that were being colonized uh, in the 1870s, 1880s. You see Egypt up there in the corner controls Egypt and Sudan, even though it nominally was under control of the Turks, it was really under control of the British. Then you see Algeria, Tunisia uh, was under control. You see some areas around Benin, uh, around Lagos. Down you see Cape Colony in the south, British. And you see German there, Southwest Africa. The interior is a long history. I mean, Stanley Livingston is the key to it. He spends 40 years of his life on the interior. And then um, Morton Stanley, uh, David Livingston, as I meant to say, is the key to it. Uh, and then uh, Morton Stanley becomes the butcher of Africa, but he does a lot of exploration. Uh, he's cutthroat killer, as opposed to David Livingston. Uh, and um, a lot of exploration takes place in the center, which they didn't know. They were trying to find the source in the Nile. They thought it was the Congo River. Then they would find the Zambezi River. They're saying, well, is this the river that connects? It was a torturous exploration that went on for decades. The, out, the circumference was known and being colonized by the Europeans. But the interior was no man's land. And people lived off of the books and memoirs of the explorers. This gives you another picture. You can see on the bottom has British, French, Portuguese, Turkish. This one has Egypt on the Turkish. It was nominally under the Turkish, but as I say, the British controlled it. Uh, you see Algiers on the top, French, Senegal. You see parts of the uh, British in the South Cape Colony. But again, the interior is unknown. The thing that changes this is the Berlin Conference which is from November 1884 to February 1885. And they basically divide up the continent. Again, they're dividing up the exterior. They don't really know the interior, but they're giving people sections of the interior. This is the famous Berlin Conference. The tall one, I'm, I'm guessing, is Bismarck. The two that are shaking hands, one is Bismarck and one is Leopold. Uh, I've written on Leopold in the past. I mean, he was a complete degenerate butcher carried out probably the first major genocide in the world was carried out by Leopold in the Congo. 10 million people may have been killed. Population growth rate collapsed, all about rubber. I mean, the guy was a complete degenerate, mentally sexual pervert, 
But it's he, and it's a long story of how the Berlin Conference gets called by Bismarck, who I believe is the one in the center. Uh, the interesting thing is you have all of Europe there. You had the United States official, the United States, I think, delegate. There's one person, there's two interesting things about the Berlin Conference. One, there was not a single African at the conference, <laughs> as you would expect. Two, there was only one person at the conference who had ever been to Africa, and that was the butcher Stanley Morton. So when they were putting all the maps on the table, they had no idea what they were looking at, because Stanley had crisscrossed the Congo on behalf of Leopold, and that's a long story, 10 years earlier, setting up Leopold's empire there. But it, he was the only one at the whole table had been to Africa. So he had explained what they were looking at when these oligarchs divided up the continent. This, I just, uh, I like this map because this gives you a, a geopolitical view of Africa. This is the way Europeans looked at Africa, but in particular, this is the British, because if you follow the development of Africa, controlling South Africa, which is where the shipping would go to get to India and China, controlling the Nile River and the Suez Canal, and controlling through the Straits of Gibraltar, these are the areas that you would want to have these sea lands controlled for your geopolitical, for your imperialist policies, of which this is how a geopolitical a geopolitical doctrine or geopolitical ideology would view Africa, not the potential of developing its people. Uh, this is, I'm just highlighting one or two people, mainly just Rhodes, because he's the most well known. He's another complete butcher representing the British Empire, representing the British East India Company spin offs. All of the companies that colonized Africa for the British and the Dutch all modeled on the grand old British East India Company. And this is what Rhodes is doing. There's the famous picture, one foot on Cairo, one foot on Cape Colony, South Africa. And their view was to build an empire that would run along the Eastern Spine, because that's what they wanted to control, the Nile all the way down to South Africa. And uh, if they built a railroad, it might have helped, but this is what their plans were. Here's what it looks like. All this is red, is roads on behalf of the British Empire. Uh, this is the states immediately following the Berlin Conference. So you can see more, if you look on the left, you see more of the um, colonial powers occupying more parts. Again, most of it is along the um, Perimeters, if you look in the middle of the Congo Free State, don't be fooled, it was, it was not a free state, that was the name Leopold gave to his colony in the Congo. So it was, there was nothing free about it. Here's another picture of post Berlin Conference. You can begin to see now it's, the deal was made at Fashoda in 1898, where the British would take complete control of the Nile River and they gave the French all West Africa. That's why you see this big section. Mali, Chad, Central Africa, Gabon, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a couple of years after the conference. So here's a picture of what Africa looked like in 1880 before the Berlin Conference. And here's a picture of the continent right before World War I. And you may not be able to see it all clearly, but if you look at the dark brown on the bottom next to the pink of the British, that Southwest Africa, the, Brit the Germans have to hand that over to the British after they lose World War I. There's a little brown spot in the middle, that's Cameroon, they have to hand that over to the French. Uh, so there was a few territories, uh, um, Tanzania, Tanjika, they had to hand that over. So there was, um, those. This, is, it changed, this map changes slightly after World War I, I think. Here's another way. Okay, so here you have it identified. German East Africa, Southwest Africa, those were handed over. So this gives you an idea uh, of what you were uh, looking at. Now I forget, I mentioned, I failed to mention in the beginning that the African population, and this is a little bit disputed, I have my own views on this, but the whole continent of Africa, they think is about 1.3 plus billion. I think Sub-Saharan Africa is close to 1.3, 1.2 billion. 
maybe the whole continent is probably over 1.5 billion. Uh, but why quibble? The projections are that by 2050, Africa will have 2.4 billion. So it'll be the largest population continent in the world. Nigeria, which has a little bit over 200 million now, will have over 400 million by 2050, according to projections, which will make it the third largest country behind China and India. I think India will be number one, China will be number two, and Nigeria will be number three. And even though the United States has over 330 million now, almost a third more than Nigeria, the uh, the baby boomer, well, baby boomer and following generations uh, did, did not want to procreate as much as Africans do. So our, even though we're far ahead of Nigeria now, we will be left behind. And this raises all kinds of serious questions because many people will say, well, gee, we should do something to reduce the population. This is very common. Uh, or you could look at it the other way and say, well, this gives us a great resource. You will have over 1 billion young people in Africa, 34 years and younger. So it will be the amount of youth in Africa will be larger than any other country except for China and India. And the workforce, because the workforce goes beyond the age of 34, those who can work, not necessarily working, and it'll be the largest workforce in the world. Therefore, why not treat that as a resource, a valuable resource, and develop those young people rather than consider it as a, a curse that you have to destroy or limit? And this is a big argument, a discussion I have all, all the time because you have fertility rates in northern Nigeria that are over seven, eight people, children per adult woman. And the argument is, well, if Nigeria would just reduce its population and wouldn't have these problems. No, it still would have a problem. The problem is not overpopulation. I mean, the whole continent is 1.4, uh, they're saying 1.3, 1.4, 1.5 billion. And you see how large it is. I mean, I've flown over Africa many times. And for whole sections, you don't see anything. I'll show you those pictures as well. Um, so those, those are the potentials that we have to uh, work with in Africa. Now, I'll just give you a snapshot of some recent history. So you have, again, I'm giving you the context and the background because most people haven't looked at it in this way. This is Kwame Nkrumah. This is Time Magazine, 1953. And he's considered the father of the liberation movements. Very interesting guy. Uh, went to school here in the United States and what is that college just over the border from Maryland to Pennsylvania. I, I gave a lecture there and I'm forgetting the college. Uh, but he was here in the United States from 1935 to 1945. And I believe he studied Roosevelt's policy because when he went back and became the president of uh, Ghana in 1957, he wrote a book and it's all about infrastructure in Africa, all about that. Uh, uniting the territory, infrastructure, railroads, banking, developing our resources, electricity. Uh, it's united, maybe united we stand. Anyway, people can get back to me. It's on my bookshelf behind, but I don't want to look for it. A very interesting figure. Of course, he was cooed. But um, to show you one aspect of Ghana at that point as a leading liberation movement of ideas around the world. This is a picture of Martin Luther King visiting Nkrumah in 1961. So it just shows you the, the quality of the leadership that Kwame Nkrumah was presenting and what the potential of just this one country was. Now this is a picture Nicholas has, and this is my favorite picture. I put this on as many articles as I can. Two smiling presidents, Kennedy, now this is March, oh, I don't have the date up there. Here it is, March 8th, 1961. So Kennedy is president from January 20th. To, he's not even president for two months. The first head of state that Kennedy invites to a head of state dinner is Kwame Nkrumah. Now, if you read Kennedy's writings, even as a Senator, he was very pro-African. He stuck his neck out as a senator supporting the Algerian revolution. Uh, 
and he look at look at the smile. What a picture! And this is the high point of U.S. Africa relations. <laughs> so now we're in 2021. So this is 50 years ago. We, we peaked in our view on Africa, and this is the press conference. Excuse me. This is the press conference when he gets off the plane, and I have recordings of the remarks. I didn't put them on this show, uh, this presentation. And Kennedy is instrumental in presenting, uh, making sure the Volta Dam melting, uh, uh, aluminum melting complex on the Volta River and producing uh, electrical power. Without Kennedy's uh, forceful intervention of a $180 million loan, that would not have taken place. And Kennedy is still known in Ghana for what he did with Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, and the British were attempting to destroy it because for them, the Africans were hot and tots, uh, the, you know, the, the efficient people who should not be developed. And of course, Kennedy, as a follower of the liberation movement supporter, he saw it differently. And of course, Kennedy is killed in 63, uh, and the, the plant be, comes into operation in 1966, and right around that time, Nkrumah is overthrown. Uh, so this gives you an idea of how developments in Africa proceeded. This is the OAU, and it was basically led by two individuals, uh, Haile Selassie, who you see right in the center, Emperor Haile Selassie, who was the last reigning empire of Ethiopia that had the blood of the founder of Ethiopia, the Melanic, uh, Sulamic blood, which came from Queen Sheba, and uh, Solomon producing a child in 900 BC. That's part of that Ethiopian history. And Kwame and Kuma, and there was a battle between Kuma, who wanted a Pan-African movement, and uh, Haile Selassie, who wanted a movement based on the nation states. And, um, but this is the OAU, Organization of African Unity, which was formed on May 25th, the day after my birthday, May 24th, and uh, this is the only African-wide inst institution that existed to represent African nations. And it became, they changed the name to AU, African Unity, in 1999 or 2000. The headquarters is in Addis Ababa. And they got a brand new headquarters several years ago given to them for free by the, the Chinese, which is a beautiful place I visited. Uh, but the institution is very weak. And there's all kinds of problems with it, but mainly the West doesn't really care about it. And uh, they're all, it's a weak institution, but at least it, there is an institution. But anytime the West wants to do something in Africa, it ignores it. For example, uh, the, the AU organized a group of African presidents to go to Libya to work, find a peaceful way when Gaddafi was under attack in 2011. And the US and French didn't care, they bombed Libya overthrew the regime and launched the biggest wave of terrorism that we saw across North Africa, including into Nigeria with Boko Haram being reinforced by the Tuaregs who, and others who left Libya after it was overthrown with uh, the pickup trucks full of ammunition and machine guns and other explosives to carry out the war. One of the stupidest, uh, in my view, evil acts of Obama, Secretary Hillary Clinton, uh, Ambassador Samantha Powers and Assistant Secretary of State Susan Rice. Uh, this, is, this will go down in infamy, and, and it still is considered that in many parts of Africa. But they ignore the AU completely and went, just went ahead. This is the latest formation called the um, African Continental Free Trade Area. This is its founding in March 2018. It took a while for a number of countries to agree to it. Uh, and it is now begun January 1st of this year, so it's uh, 10 days old. It's a, it, I, the idea behind it is to use the power of having over a billion people in all these countries as a single market. It has attached with it the idea of free movement where any African would be a citizen of the whole continent. Right now there's duties, there's restrictions, uh, passports, it's very not easy to travel around Africa, but um, this is uh, going to be, it's, it's not going to have an effect right away. And, but on the other hand, 
it is an important step forward where African leaders are going to use the power of their entire continental market to develop uh, the capabilities of the continent. And the idea would be various businesses, entrepreneurs could then trade with the whole continent and the whole continent can bargain as one. I mean, right now, only 12 to 15 percent of trade by African nations is between African nations. 12 to 15 percent between African nations. That means 85 plus is done, trade is done with the rest of the world. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a second to get a drink. Uh, also, I didn't know if there was any uh, questions that people wanted to raise at this point. But I want, this is pretty much still a background presentation. And maybe if you want to address just a, a thought, um, what developments have there been on like the creation of something like the United States of Africa? That was, that was what Kami Kuhn was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And before him, there were others. There's a brilliant guy, a Senegalese named Cheek Antet Diop last name D-I-O-P. And he actually wrote a book in the 1950s called The United States of Africa. And he, this guy was, is, was really amazing. I have a, I saw a video of him from 1980s. I got from some of our friends in France. And he was promoting nuclear power in Africa. For the fast, uh, He was promoting, uh, of course, fission power. Uh, and he also said, look, we, we have the Congo River. We can produce tens of thousands, over 100,000 megawatts of power. He was way ahead of his time. Kwame Nkrumah was very clear in his book, United, I think it's United We Stand. You can send me an email afterwards if I, if I got the book wrong. And he actually explicitly called for United States of Africa built around an infrastructure uh, conception. So this has been there uh, in Africa. Okay, I'll go back to screen sharing. Uh, Hope everyone's still alive because we got, I just, but I really can't discuss Africa without giving you this background. I hope it's been helpful. Yeah, yeah no, Lawrence, it's really, it's, it's very good that you're putting all of this on record in one, in one place. I really think it's worth you going through the extra time to, to set the context and really, uh, we're going to, I'm going to be personally sharing this far and wide. Uh, it's a really wonderful introduction. So thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's good. All right, I just, uh, now, where is Africa today? It's really a uh, very, very poor country. Now this is, I've been to Darfur camps a couple of times. Uh, the second time I went, I took my wife so she could see what the rest of the world can look like, looks like sometimes. And of course, it's a very shocking experience. This is typical. This is a Zam Zam, uh, refugee camp for internally displaced people in Darfur, West Sudan. And they're basically lining up with jerry cans to pump water. I'll show you that in a second out of that membrane on the left. Now think about this from a standpoint of labor power, which is something that Hamilton discussed. What a waste. What a waste of your time, four hours a day with the women and the children going to collect water. Because I mean, could you think of anything more stupid? But yet, this is the way people are treated. This is uh, in Zamzam. I think this is this is how people live. They just put stuff on the ground. This is a market. Everything in Africa exists around markets. You take away the markets, you take away Africa. Every, they're all different. I, every country I go to, I always go to a market because I want to study how it works. Some of them are huge. I mean. <laughs> But this is a market in a refugee camp. This is another portion of the refugee camp. You don't have, they're not wasting any money on overhead here. This is housing on the dirt sand there. This gives you some of the mud structures. These are kids, garbage playing. This is one of the most, this is a big crime. The collecting of wood, which goes on all over Africa because we don't give them gas and electricity. Now the environmentalists are correct that this is actually just advancing the desert. 
but none of the environmentalist movements or human rights movements will advocate what should be done to prevent this, which is give them access to electricity and gas. So even people, I, I stayed with a teacher in Mali and we had to stop off to buy charcoal and that's a long discussion, how you make charcoal, it's been done for thousands of years out of wood called charcoaling because there's no gas and electricity in the house. So this is common. It's, and it's, it's, it's so counterproductive in parts of Africa. It's done by young children, females, who carry piles and piles of wood on their head and then sell them. And it, you can't, again, this is another area of criminal activity, in my view. Here's, oh, I didn't have, this is the membrane which is donated and this is where the water is pumped out of. And here's another picture, I guess I had another picture of mine. One day I just spent a little bit of time helping them pump water into the, into the jerry cans. This is a hospital closed on Friday because it's, it was Islamic, they were closed on Friday. So my wife and I were just walking around the camp and I was taking pictures. I, I have another picture of a school somewhere. And these are kids just playing, they were all excited by us in our car or truck, I forget which, riding through the camp and they were just following us around these are young children. Those are all young minds. They're all young and happy. And why aren't we developing those minds that standing live in a place like this where you've had, we interviewed some adult, well, not adult, teenager who had been living in an IDP camp for eight years. Now think of the effect of living in an IDP camp for eight years. You, your whole view of the world is completely stunted, distorted, perverted. Because all you've been doing is living in this camp. So you don't even know really it's, not quite like Plato's uh, people coming out of the cave, but you can see how the effect. So this is the overview of one aspect I wanted to give you. Now we're gonna get into the economics side of it a bit, but I um, thought you should have some of these. I mean, I have hundreds and hundreds of pictures, but um, we only have two hours, not 20 hours to go through it all. Now we wanna go back to that image you had of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, now, this, just to give you an idea, uh, 27 of the 28 poorest countries in the world are African nations. The uh, 20, in 1990, Africa is the only continent where poverty is increasing. And we define poverty as extreme poverty, $1.90 $1 or less per day. That's the standard poverty figure that everybody uses. You have, Africa is the only continent where poverty is increasing as a absolute figure. Uh, 1990, you had 278 million living in poverty in Africa, I mean, in Sub-Saharan Africa, excuse me, Sub-Saharan Africa, which was 54% of the population. In 2015, uh, 25 years later, you had 413 million people living in poverty. And in 2020, you have 440 million. Now the percentage of the total population is decreasing, it's about 40% of the population because of so many, the population greater growth, but the absolute number is increasing. And the projection is that by uh, 2000, I'm thinking 2030, uh, nine out of 10 people in the world living in poverty will be living, uh, will be in Africa. 55% of those living in urban areas in Africa are living in slum conditions. So uh, right now Africa has 60% of the total poor. And in the decades ahead, it may have 90% if we don't do something to change this. Electricity is, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, is a kill, is, the lack of electricity is a killer, not figuratively, literally. This is what, now this is a few years old, but this is what one figure was, 91 megawatts, which is 91 million watts per million people to the United States. So that's four to one. Estimates are that between 100,000 and 130,000 megawatts of power in sub-Saharan Africa for over a billion people. 
The only country that has any power is South Africa, which has two nuclear power plants, the only two on the continent, which has 40,000 megawatts, and they're suffering because of a lack of power. Nigeria, which has over 200 million people, has on record 7,500 installed power, but distributes between four and 5,000. And every time I go to Nigeria, it doesn't matter where you go, people have private generators and battery packs, and they spend many times more on electricity than you and I spend in our homes here uh, where we live. So this is um, a scandal. And without an increase in electrical power, Africa is, is going to suffer massively, especially as its population doubles over the period ahead. This is, so this is a nice picture because it shows you uh, where we are. Uh, 600 million Africans lack electrical power, and you can see it. And this is not a made up picture. I mean, I've flown over this area. This is the reality. Uh, only 43% uh, of sub-Saharan Africa, the part below the desert, have access to electricity, compared to the global average of 87%. Africa has 20% of the world's population and uses 4% of the power produced in the world. So this, these are devastating uh, figures for a continent, for the old people. Now, just to show you, here's a bigger picture. So you see, if you go back to here, up along the coast, that's the Maghreb, North Africa. I told you Northern Africa is different. In the middle, that's Nigeria. On the bottom, that's South Africa. And that's where your concentration of electrical power is. And then that is minimal. So then compare that to the rest of the world. There's Europe, there's the United States, other countries. The dark continent. Here's a map of access. So this, this is fairly accurate. It gives you on the bottom here share of uh, the share of uh, without access. So the, the darker the picture, the less access there is. Uganda, Congo. Central African Republic, Chad. Nigeria is not in that area because of the total, but it, it's, it's not actually accurate because the power is divided over so many people, it doesn't exist really. Um, but they do it through private generators. And the northern part you see is beige, that's where there is access to electricity. Tunisia, all along the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, if you look at, uh, for example, road density, Road density is the amount of roads that exist. You measure the kilometers of a road and you divide it by the square kilometers of the, of the land area you're dealing with. So road density in Africa averages 204 kilometers of road per 1,000 square kilometers of land. But only 25% of those roads are paved. Now, if any of you have been to Africa, uh, traveling on unpaved roads is an experience. <laughs> we distorted at least one car traveling on unpaved road to get to the floor once many, many years ago in Sudan. The world average is 944 kilometers of road per 1,000 square area. So Africa at best is one fifth, and that's not counting the fact that most of the roads are unpaved. There are also the African roads because they're unpaved. Driving is an experience. I never drive, it's just being driven is an experience. Um, they're also the most dangerous roads in the world. More people kill on African roads than anywhere else uh, in the world. Health access, safe water, only slightly more than 60% of the population has safe, clean, potable water. Only 31%, more than 31% has clean sanitation. Physicians in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are 2.34 physicians per 1,000 people. In the rest of the OECD, it's 3.4 physicians, but it's less, it's two, 23 hundredths of a physician per 1,000 people compared to 3.4. Beds per population in Africa, 0.56, a half a percent. In the world is 2.9, I'm not, and the world standards are not that good. Now here's the key for our, this, Background and infrastructure 
And the figures I'm going to give you now are the key to understanding why we have to have the Hamiltonian program. Manufacturing output in Africa is almost non-existent. I haven't, wasn't able to find a current figure, but a few years ago, um, less than five, there, there's a figure of value added to world trade. Africa contributes less than 3% of the value added of products in world trade. Three, less than 3% of value added products in world trade. And Africa produces a total of uh, $190 billion dollars, a sub-Saharan Africa, $190 billion in manufacturing output. The world produces 13.7 trillion. I'm not that good at math, but I'm, I think I came up with a figure of about 1.5% of manufacturing output. The basic problem is Africa doesn't have manufacturing. It doesn't have infrastructure. This is a picture the ER magazine produced of Fusion Energy Foundation, which gives you the idea. Colonial railroads from point of source of raw material to the port. And this is a proposal of what it should be. Um, this is a proposal by the African Union for a road network. Now, the northern southern portion of this road network has been completed, which is the Red Four. I think it's completed, but this is just a road. The yellow, which goes from Djibouti to six to N'Djamena and over to Senegal, I don't think that's been completed. And the eight has not been completed because the section in Bangui, which is Central African Republic, and I'm trying to remember if the section in the DRC has been completed. But these are roads. There should have been an east-west highway 50 years ago, when the liberation movements began in the 1960s, there's no high-speed rail. Rail is only now in the last 20 years being built for the first time since the colonial empires had their rinky-dink railroads in the, a century ago, in the 1800s. But this, uh, this is a project that would connect Africa with roads. But you can see from my figures of road density, this is very minimal for what the continent needs. These are transmission engineering uh, energy proposals, again, by the AU. They have, uh, and you can see some of them are significant. Some of them are being built. The Millennium Dam will discuss 5,200 megawatts. It's actually uh, projected to have 6,200 megawatts. Uh, the Grand Inca Dam should be here somewhere, and I don't see it. So that's a big problem because the Grand Inca, here it is, Inca. INGA projected a 4200, which is something that's been around known, as I say, since Chicanta Dia in the 1950s. And the West has no support for this program. The West, most of these programs, and Nicholas has a great deal of information on this in his spreadsheets, uh, most of these are being developed by Africans in conjunction with China, India, it's a little bit of Russia, even Turks have involvement in, in some of the infrastructure projects. But the West is absent as a matter of policy, so with very few exceptions. This is the Grand Inca here, which is proposed to bring transmission of energy all the way up into Egypt, all the way down to South Africa. Uh, this would be a very important project. The major support for this comes from South Africa, which has already, already commissioned the electricity even though it hasn't been built. Again, when the uh, so-called Power Africa was developed by President Obama, which I was a fraud in my view, he never even mentioned the Grand Inca, which is the most obvious project that would transform the continent. This is a picture of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. It's a, obviously an artist's rendition. It's about 75% completed. Uh, big, big controversy around this. Um, I know the controversy well. I've studied the whole history of it. The Ethiopians have every right to develop this dam and the power behind this dam. And this will be the largest dam in Africa and will catapult Ethiopia into the second largest energy producer behind uh, South Africa. This is a railroad that was just built 2016. I traveled on just an inaugural visit when it was opened in 2016. 
this railroad connects Addis Ababa to Djibouti, which gives them a port. And this enables Ethiopia to try to develop some and manufacturing. They're the leading manufacturing uh, uh, country and light manufacturing in Africa. This was built with the Chinese using Ethiopian labor, Djiboutian labor, and Chinese labor. Uh, this, why this wasn't built 50 years ago, but at least it's, and it's run by electricity. There's the first such electrically run train in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is Lee Quay when he was, I think the vice premier or premier, I'm not sure he is anymore, meeting with the heads of the fellow on the right, Salva Kiir with the cowboy hat, South Sudan, Kagame with the sunglasses, Kenyatta, Kenya, Kagame is uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, Kenyatta from Kenya, and then the guy with the flat hat and the yellow tie, that's Museveni. Now, I'm not saying these are the greatest people that ever lived, but they are actually established a major effort to build infrastructure. And here's part of the plan. This is a railroad conception. Look, that would, the first phase is done between Mombasa and Nairobi and to go all the way into Kisigani, go all the way up to Juba, South Sudan, Kisigani is DRC, all the way up to, to Ethiopia. In my view, this keeps going west, it becomes the leg, the eastern leg of an east-west railroad. Uh, this is Tanzania, which is also building, and their first phase was done with a Turkish company. Who knew the Turkish would be involved? But nevertheless, they're the only Western country that's building any infrastructure. So these are small efforts. This is not even close to what has to be done. This is all happening in the last 10 years. Here's the east, uh, the, the east, the southern border train in Nigeria, which is being built right now. This is the complex, uh, which part of this has been built from Lagos to Abuja has been built, and Abuja up to Kano would be critical because Kano is sort of the capital of the north, the Hausa, in uh, Nigeria. I've been to all these many of these places, and then up to the border, Castina, Castina, with his Niger. These are all going ahead under President Buhari, uh, which to his credit, because there was no railroads. I, I was friends with President Buhari for many years before he was president and we've met after. And we used to get together for lunch or dinner when I was in Nigeria. And he said he was the military administrator in 18, 18, uh, 1983 to 1985. And he told me once he was in his car with his chauffeur and they heard a sound of a train. And he told the chauffeur, Follow that sound. I've never seen a train in Nigeria. And of course, there were many. Now, this, um, I don't know really because I'm looking at the time. Uh, I'm just going to very quickly go through Transact, because it was mentioned by Matt. And it's, uh, it gives you the idea of the, the type of transformation projects we should have. This is people living on Lake Chad. They live on the lake. Uh, and they live illegally on the lake. And this is typical village we visited. This boat is a school bus taking people from these shacks, if you will, to go to school. This is the lake. Now, the key thing about Lake Chad is the lake has been shrinking since 1960. Now, prehistoric time, I mean, not prehistoric, going back a few thousand years, the lake was gigantic. It was a million square miles, a million square kilometers, 400,000 square kilometers. 1960, it was 25,000 square kilometers. Today, it's 1,500 to 2,000. And the lake provides for an entire region called the Lake Chad Basin, which includes Nigeria, Central African Republic, Chad, Cameroon, Niger, primarily. But it's, it extends even beyond the basin. is huge. It goes all the way up to Algeria, all the way up to Sudan. There, this is a picture that my wife and I took on the lake. I'm probably one of the few Americans who's ever been on the lake. He's standing in water up to his ankle. <laughs> it's amazing that this boat even floats because the lake has been so depleted of water. This is the proposal that myself and others have been supporting, which is Transaqua, which is to take small dams uh, re uh, extracting or reducing the flow of tributaries into the Congo River, that big red line, 
and using it to build a canal that would go into Central African Republic, which is where it would connect to the Chari River. And with 50 billion plus cubic meters of water a year from this gravity canal, we could replenish Lake Chad and save the Lake Chad and refurbish and transform the Lake Chad Basin. This would also, because it goes through Central Africa Republic where that red dot is, this would take the poorest country in the world, arguably, Central Africa Republic, I'm reviewing it now, and it would transform it into a major dry port industrial base as part of Transaqua. And there you see, if you look on the right, you see the yellow mark is the uh, slanted direction, uh, right to left of Transaqua, they would cross over the east-west highway, especially the, the road from Lagos to Mbasa, which is there's a port there. This would transform 12 nations immediately in the Lake Con in the Lake Great Lakes region and the Lake Chad region. This fellow on the right, Marcello Vicky Bonifica, the founder of this, he's very old now. He was old then when we met, I think I went to Rome in 2015, somewhere around there. That's me when I was still shaving. And that's Mohamed Billa, a geologist who worked for Lake Chad Basin. We became very good friends over the years. And there we established the Lake Chad Basin Conference. I don't have a picture of it. We, myself and others, we formed the Lake Chad Basin Conference in Abuja 2016, uh, 18. And uh, Joanna Meyer was on this call, she was there. That's me sitting next to the uh, ambassador from China. This is me presenting the conference where I was a major advocate and we eventually got Transaqua adopted as the proposal. And these are your heads of state in the middle of Buhari, uh, to his left, I think, is Isafu. To his right, I think, is Debbie. The fellow all the way on the right end is Sanuzi Abdullahi, my collaborator on the Lake Chad Basin Commission. And then his replacement, who hasn't been as energetic on the issue, is Sanuzi um, Ambassador Amin uh, um, uh, Nuhu. Now, the Silk Road has been a game changer for Africa because it's now made Africa a key point of development. And you can see just from what I've given you in Tanzania, in Ethiopia, in Kenya, they're building up the East Coast of Africa, which the Chinese were the first ones to visit in 1414. So the Europeans were taking slaves on the West Coast and the Chinese were visiting the East Coast. And the only thing they were taking back was animals to show the emperor. They took back a giraffe on one of their boats but they're building up the whole East Coast. Uh, so this is a, the, without China, and I know there's a lot of discussion about China being a colonial power and indebtedness. None of it is true. We can schedule another seminar for this. This is not true. It's all lies. There's not one country in Africa that's been taken over by China, not one project in Africa that's been taken over by China as a result of failing to pay loans on debt. It just never happened. But that doesn't stop the propaganda. And here is a more advanced by ER Magazine. And this shows you a more advanced conception of a land bridge that would connect Africa directly on two routes into Eurasia and Eurasia into the United States and down to the United States into South America. So this projection, you could travel from the uh, Cape in South Africa down to the tip of Chile. It'd be a long train ride, but I'm sure it'd be very enjoyable. And all this is possible, as many people on this presentation know. Now, on your right, you see what could happen. So I don't want to leave you with a pessimistic view of Africa. Of course, the person who did this uh, made Lake Chad the center. So that's, that's Lake Chad and radiating out and you see electricity everywhere. And this is all possible. We're talking about simple building, constructing, engineering. It all can be done. There's nothing that would stop us. This could be the future. So I, I want to um, stop my screen sharing unless you want to leave with that. We can continue with that picture for a while. Okay. Now, from this standpoint of the future, this is what we have to do to change Africa. Why is Africa like this? Well, there's no continent in the world that has gone through five hundred years, continuous years of first 
slavery, 400 years, 100 years of colonialism, and then since liberation, 1960, 100 years, or not 100 years, but getting up there, 60 years of neo-colonialism. There's been no period where the nations have been what I would call sovereign, economically independent. Their economies have never been run by themselves, not even South Africa. It's a whole story behind Mandela becoming the president, which freed the country politically or changed the country politically, but not economically. This condition of Africa today is a result of 500 continuous years of one form or another of subjugation. And the, the West has never taken this, has not taken the steps for the last 60 years to begin to actually support the economic development of Africa. So there's no physical economy. That is, we're not talking about money. Money is not the issue here. Roads, as I went through, hospitals, electricity. None of this exists in any level that would be necessary to sustain uh, population. And this has been going on since independence of 1960 movements. You have, Af the West is focused in a different direction. United Nations, UNESCO, uh, H uh, various human rights organizations, uh, NGOs, all of them have been focused on, well, let's have good governance. Let's have human rights. Let's have democracy. You can't have any of that without economic development. I'll be with you in a second, Joanna. You can't have any of that without development. The, when you have mothers who are thinking about how to feed the children the next day, is a primary concern to get one meal. You're not gonna have democracy. Democracy requires leisure time. It requires a minimal standard of living. So the, the whole emphasis of the West, and this is where I have big arguments, uh, is wrong. And China, whatever its imperfections, I'm not saying they're not, is moving in a different direction. Did you want to say something, Joanna? I saw you waving your hand. I have a question. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, you know, you said before, and I, I follow it also, uh, how much U.S. involvement there is in in Africa. Certainly, there is involvement in peacekeeping and there's mm -hmm. private sector. But uh, in looking at transportation specifically and uh, the way forward in, well, Pete Buttigieg will be the the uh, you know we think will be the director of uh, transportation in the U.S. Do you think that will that forward thinking will, uh, you know, what I think he, he, he carries will influence the U.S.'s interest in being involved in uh, some part of the Belt and Road Project, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily, you know, making the roads, but, but in, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm just uh, brainstorming. But do you think that the, the U.S. will be more interested in participating in that, uh, you know? Um, you don't work in Africa unless you're an optimist. Okay. And that's what should happen. Uh, but it would mean reversing the ideology that we've seen. And I know a lot of people get all worked up over the Trump administration, but it was, it was just as bad. And, and of course, uh, Obama administration destroyed North Africa. Clinton, sure. Clinton yeah, I'm not. I'm not. De I'm not denying how how it's been up until yeah, now. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. like, like personally, you know, I, I I want the African continental free trade area to be strong. I want to see all these railroads. You know, I want to be able to take a high speed train from Algiers to Lagos, uh, like it's really easy. And so, uh, you know. Um, but, but, did the the ability to do that would mean reversing the ideology that the United States had towards Africa since the death of President John Kennedy. Is mm -hmm. it possible? Of course, that's what I work on. Is it possible that there'll be some people in the Biden administration? I, I hope so. There is one person in his administration who's extremely knowledgeable about Africa, which is his um, nominee for ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas Greenfield. 
but she doesn't agree with everything that I put forward. Mm-hmm. That's what we have to try to do. We, we have to try to get the United States back in the game. I mean, Africans want the United States. They want the United States. The United it's States true. Is huge it's true. America. And they come here, like Kenyatta was here a few years ago, and he said, please, join us so we can work both with China and the United States. They don't like it either or. But mm-hmm. if someone is working to develop the basic necessities of your life, which the Chinese are doing, you're not going to say no because the U.S. has a problem. So hopefully right. we'll get the U.S. involved in this. So let me continue now. We've one more feature uh, of Africa that may not have been completely obvious from my presentation. Is oh. are you uh, are you uh, doing a PowerPoint again? No, I'm going to just I'm done. Okay. With the PowerPoint right. uh, is the question of the nation state. The French in their own way, very insidious. I saw it again when I, uh, when I went to Cote d'Ivoire a month ago, and the British very overtly. They did everything they could when they left to do two things. One, no infrastructure. Minimal infrastructure was port to resource or to carry troops. And two is no strong nation state. Now, this is something that came out of the uh, Westphalia Treaty of 1648. The Europeans have it. The United States expresses it most beautifully, in my view. There is a nation. It is a nation that acts in the interest of all its people, no matter where they come from or who they are, at its best. We're not doing that. We haven't done that in a while here in the U.S. But at its principle, as our founding fathers designed it, especially in the preamble to the Constitution, this is what we are and should be. In, the, in, Europe, in, in Africa, they don't even have that. They're the fights that go on around ethnicity, which are nurtured by the Europeans, but also existed by themselves, such as you're seeing in Ethiopia today. Abi is trying to prevent, present a national identity of Ethiopia, and he's being fought, they're fighting him. That's what he wants to do. I mean, I know that. This is, the, in Nigeria, there's, the not a nation state. You're, and you have people who are attacking Nigeria, trying to destroy its capability of being a nation state, including people in the West, not just Boko Haram. This is all over Africa. This, you need a nation state. Why? For all the reasons that Hamilton and our founding fathers understood. Because the nation can provide credit and development beyond any simple locale. And we need a nation state in Africa, strong nation states, not strong men, but strong nation state. And we need to adopt the Hamiltonian policy. And the two key areas are credit and manufacturing. Right now, African countries cannot get credit, cannot create credit themselves. Now for us, it's in our constitution, article one, we can create credit. And we've done it more explicitly on the Hamilton National Bank, and we've done it in other ways. Roosevelt did it under the great Jesse Jones of the Reconstruction Finance Company. What a character he was, but he did it. He created more billions of dollars in credit than any single individual in the history of the United States. It was probably done by Jesse Jones of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And we've done it other ways. But in Africa, the currencies are so weak, they're not convertible. So if you travel back from Africa and I have drawers full of money from Naira and Sudan and Mali and Cote d'Ivoire, it's worthless outside that country because no one will accept it. So the, the nations are not strong enough to create their own credit. I had a discussion with then uh, President Bahari before he's president to use the petroleum of Nigeria as a basis to create a credit development bank. And he did it in such a minimal way, it didn't have an effect. So it's very hard for these nations to have credit by themselves. Therefore, the offers of China to give them long-term loans at very low interest rates, they'd be fools to pass it up because the the problem is they, they can't create the credit on their own. As long as they can't create credit and they don't have a strong nation, they allow themselves, they're in a predicament of they they're continually raped by their natural resources. The most fundamental resource of the entire world as we've known it to date is the human mind. 
creativity is a source of all wealth. What's under the ground can be used by human beings, but it has no inherent wealth itself. And therefore, if we're not developing human beings and don't give them a material standard of living to develop, we're not really concerned about development and we haven't been in Africa. Now look what Hamilton does and the founding fathers. They take an agrarian based society, 90% of the people at the time of the revolution were involved in agricultural production. And within a short period of time, by the, even by the time of Lincoln, they transformed the country into an economic powerhouse. And then of course, the next hundred years are uneven, but again, on the Roosevelt, we become an economic powerhouse again. Therefore, you know it can be done. How is it done? It is done by understanding certain scientific principles. If you don't have infrastructure, you can't have a, a robust developing economy. If you surround these uh, uh, farmers with water, with railroads and roads to get to the railroads, which is what the Ethiopians are trying to do, by just the density of infrastructure, you increase the productivity of any worker or any farmer. And in my view in Africa, I think electricity and rail are the most two important things we give. And then they're not the only ones. We need all kinds of hard and soft infrastructure. We need hospitals, as you should see. We need schools, we need libraries. These are huge undertakings. But without hard infrastructure, these countries are gonna, are gonna suffer and they may suffer worse as the population grows because they're gonna have a lot of young people. And if those young people don't have jobs and don't have a view of the future, that they can raise a family and have children and have grandchildren, they be, they're easily recruited. I mean, Boko Haram recruits at ease. You just give $200 to alienated youth in Cameroon and Nigeria. It's not very hard. But how do you prevent that? You can't do it by security alone. You give development to people. You give them the potential to remove themselves from these conditions. And uh, without a credit policy and a manufacturing policy, manufacturing policy and infrastructure policy, nothing will change in Africa on the level it should change. I have a quote here from Hamilton on the, from his report on the National Bank. The intrinsic wealth of a nation is to be measured not by the abundance of precious metals contained in it, but by the quantity of productions of its labor and industry, which he calls in the report of manufacturing, he eventually, I mean, he calls that the productive powers of labor. Uh, in his, also in his report on credit, Hamilton says, a report on manufacturers, the, pur the purpose of creating credit but through a funded debt, uh, but though a funded debt is not in the first instance an absolute increase in capital or an augmentation of real wealth, yet by serving as a new power, the operations of industry, it has written, it has within certain bounds a tendency to increase the real wealth of a community. And a like money as money borrowed by a, thr by a thrifty farmer to be laid out for the improvement of his farm may in the end add to the stock of his real riches. In the power to raise money, I'm sorry, if the power to raise money is plenary and indefinite and the objects to which it is appropriated are no less comprehensive than the payment of public debts and the providing of the common defense and the general welfare. Hamilton's whole fine credit policy and manufacturing policy were guided by the conception of the common good. How do you raise the standard of living of people? And we were an agrarian society. So who is Hamilton fighting against? He's fighting against the British who opposed the United States becoming independently sovereign economically, exactly what has been done to African nations. The United States Revolution was a wonderful success. The African liberation from the colonial powers was not a great success because the minute they became liberated, they were still under the financial control of the same international 
financial and political forces. They never freed themselves. And there were coups and people killed all over. We don't have the time to go through it. I mean, Kwame Nkrumah was, was couped. Patrice Lumumba was killed. The leaders of uh, Nigeria were killed. So Ahmadou Bello, Awulu. This happened all over the continent. So the, the countries were never allowed to develop the way the United States was allowed to develop in the interest of the common good. And the British, Adam Smith was explicit. The idea that the wealth of nations could be considered the founding economic document of the United States is a cruel joke, which only made for the ignorant who don't want to think. The British were obsessed and, and Adam Smith wrote the wealth of nations to prevent the United States from developing. I'll read you a quote from the wealth of nations uh, he says, were the Americans, either by combination or by any sort of violence, to stop the importation of European manufacturing and by thus given a monopoly to such of their own country, countrymen, as could manufacture the like goods and divert the considerable part of the capital from this employment, they would retard instead of creating the further increase in value. In other words, if the colonial powers stopped manufacturing and bought their goods from Europe, from Britain, then they would grow. And if they did the opposite, they would collapse. I mean, complete nonsense. This is, and you have the same problem internally in the United States with uh, the, the believers in states' rights, the, the physiocrats, the people in the South who believed in slavery. They were opposed to manufacturing, rather than seeing the obvious, which is manufacturing would actually increase the value of farming. And uh, uh, Hamilton was, uh, you know, was very clear on this question, that if you increased the manufacturing ability, you could move agricultural production at a much higher rate. I've lost that uh, quote for the moment. But this is something that was, was very clear. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I would suggest, by the way, I know Nancy Spanish's book last week. She spoke on it. It's a very useful book. But I would suggest everybody read the four reports written between 1789 and 1791 by Hamilton, uh, commissioned by uh, President uh, George Washington, who understood the importance of this and the importance of supporting Hamilton on this. But uh, I'll give you one quote here from Hamilton from his report on manufacturing. Whence it follows that it is in the interest of a community with a view to eventual and permanent economy to encourage the growth of manufacturers. In a national view, a temporary enhancement of price must always well be compensated by a permanent reduction of it. And then he goes on to say how the government has to help support industry. Protectionism, nurturing development of industry is a national security question. Hamilton says that development of manufacturing establishes a direct and important tendency to benefit agriculture. It enables the farmers to procure with a smaller quantity of its labor the manufactured produce of which it stands in need and consequently increases the value of its income and its property. So the idea that by having a manufacture, by moving toward the manufacturing society would destroy the United States was a deliberate effort to undermine the actual building of the United States and the founding of, this, of the United States because actually manufacturing complements agriculture. Instead of having to buy your tractors overseas, you produce them. And it actually, if the United States was laid out better, because right now we have all our farming in the Midwest, which I know very well, I spent two years organizing farmers about 40 years ago. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't have all your farming there. You'd have farming next to industry, which is actually more the way that uh, exists in, in, in parts of Germany. But the, the Hamilton goes on, not only the wealth but the independence and security of a country appear to be materially connected with the prosperity of manufacturers. Every nation 
with a view to those great objects ought to endeavor to possess within itself the essentials of national supply. Com these comprise the means of subsistence, habitation, clothing, and defense. And this is what Africa doesn't have. They, that's why I say they're not economically sovereign, independent nation state. They don't determine their own economy. Things have begun to change. And I would say in the year 2000, China began to have a significant influence and they, left, they launched their program called the Forum on Cooperation, uh, African-China Cooperation, FUCA. And then they began to build Kenya, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Angola, South Africa, all over the continent, the infrastructure, energy and rail, some airports, and the West went crazy. They went absolutely nuts. And of course, it, it was under uh, John Bolton, uh, Trump's national security advisor, that he explicitly stated that the African policy of the U.S. was to counter China, i.e. counter development. So there's a lot of trade, financial support, insurance, and reinsurance for uh, private sector. But the private sector will feed off of the public sector. The public sector, i.e. government credit, is the only means of creating infrastructure on the scale necessary. The United States has proved that over and over again. China is essentially copying the American system. Whether they consciously know this, I don't have enough knowledge. But I know the effects of what they're doing is exactly what the American system was intended to do. You issue credit for long-term development, and, in, and then you will see growth will follow. So the idea that we can just sit back and support the private sector, the private sector is not going into Africa. Why? Because the infrastructure isn't there, because the manufacturing isn't there, because the skill levels aren't there. Why aren't they there? Because for 500 years, we've been prevented from developing them. Now, this is very controversial. People criticize me all the time, say, oh, Africa, you should get over it. Colonialism ended 60 years ago. Why are you still talking about it? And those obviously uh, are very short-sighted people, narrow-minded. One of the names given to me in Africa or in the United States is I'm an anti-colonialist. I'm an eccentric because I want to support Africa. I accept both of those. There is no way anything's going to change without a Hamiltonian perspective. Now, the good news is there are various countries that are listening to this. I'm circulating these ideas and actually Nancy Spanos' book as well in various African nations. There are papers that I'm writing on the subject. There's a great deal of interest. And I think that if we see enough coming from certain countries, I think Ethiopia is trying to move in the right direction. I think Cote d'Ivoire is trying to move in the right direction. I think there are others. We may be able to start a trend towards a Hamiltonian policy throughout the continent, but they are going to need credit. They, we, there's not question, we don't need to take over what they're doing. We need to give them the means of which they can build for themselves. And as Hamilton brilliantly outlined, that is done by credit. Credit is not money. Credit is something that you create a future around. Money is something you make today and claim you're wealthy. Credit is something that enables you to build something that will last into the future. And not only last, but improve the economic wealth of the country involved. And then we should have tr transcontinental infrastructure, East-West Railroad, North-West Railroad, Transaqua. Transaqua was developed by Marcello Vicky in 1978. He personally took it around to African countries in the 1980s when he was 40 years younger. And this idea that has been kicking around now for four decades that people say, oh, it's too expensive. We can't do that. Cost $40 billion to build Transaqua, 50 billion. Gee, where are we gonna get the money? We spent more than that burying the people in Africa who are dying from disease and war which has been unnecessary. Rather than building something transformative, we think about the difficulties of surviving because we've lost the vision. The last president we had who had a vision was John Kennedy, a follower of Franklin Roosevelt, explicitly. 
who was a follower of Alexander Hamilton. So the world can change. And uh, this is what my dedication is. I'm approaching 70 years old. This is what I do. This is my passion. And uh, to answer <clears throat> Joanna's question, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. I have contacts. Some contacts have contacts in the current, the new administration coming in. I tried to influence the last administration. I will try to influence whoever I can. And then the Africans themselves may emerge and take up responsibility and take up a change in policy and Hamiltonian perspective. And, and we may see a continent totally different a decade or two from now than from the way it is today. Uh, so I guess I've kept you going for a long time. I guess I should open up for questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Lawrence. This is really great. And what I'll uh, do, I, I just have to ask you, uh, Larry, how much time do you have for questions? 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? Yeah, um, I, ex I exist on answering questions. <laughs> okay, all right, that's what I wanted to hear. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll make this a standalone video. We're gonna have the Q&A as a separate video so people who are inspired by Larry's presentation can go and click on their, our next YouTube video, which will be the Q&A uh, that's about to proceed. Um, <clears throat> I already have a list of a few people who want to ask questions in queue. Um, so let me just start uh, with Aaron, the first person I saw. Uh, what's your thought? Ah! 